today we're doing a double act, um, but I think it will be mostly Matt uh, because he's currently the head of track and he knows all the ins and outs, um, the recent development. So over to you, Matt. Thank you, Sinsin, and thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction. Um, I will share my screen with you and uh, we'll dive straight in. OK, so um, hopefully everyone can uh, can see that OK. So to start off with, just to give you a little bit of background on the high speed track asset. So as you can see, we're uh, we're a little slither um, we're, we're small, but uh, but highly critical. So the HS1 line provides the only rail link out, out of the UK. Uh, or in, depending on your persuasion, uh, and, and is formed of three sections with very different characteristics. So the first part to open, section one, connected the channel tunnel uh, through to Waterloo via a, a conventional um, third rail electrified area coming off at Fulcombe Junction. Section one contains uh, a lot of it, it's the fully high speed section of the network up to 300 kilometers an hour, but also has a lot of curbs uh, and, and a lot of changes of gradient as we pass through the uh, wonderful Kent countryside. Also, we've got quite a lot of SNC for a high speed line, so approximately every 20 kilometers we've got passing um, crossovers and then three passing loops that allow us to move trains around um, in, in instances of service disruption and also to provide us with the opportunity for single line working to deliver engineering work. In 2007, a second section of the line was built, which connected uh, us through to St Pancras and, and provided a dedicated high speed line, uh, shading a, a significant amount off of an already pretty decent journey time. So that this gave us two new stations to manage, uh, Ebbsfleet International and Stratford International, um, and gave us a, a line speed of 230 kilometers an hour through most of the section. It, it's characterized by the three long tunnels, um, which are all uh, of an embedded slab track construction, uh, single bore tunnels. And then this connects through to a, effectively a London terminal at St Pancras. So uh, we've we've got lots of tight radius curves, RT60, S and C, um, and a total of nine platforms. We proudly claim the uh, highest uh, speed on rail in the UK at 208 miles an hour or 93 meters per second for those who prefer their SI units. And there's a, a little plaque just on the end of Medway Viaduct for any of you in, in the area to commemorate this. Um, it pales in comparison somewhat to the 575 kilometers an hour uh, achieved by the TGV. Um, and that, that sets HS to a, a nice little target to aim for, um, hopefully in a few years time. So a little bit about our operating model. So um, we're, we're quite a, a unique one for the UK. So Network Rail High Speed Limited is an independent business contracted to operate, maintain and renew the infrastructure on behalf of HS1 Limited. So um, we're effectively a, an infrastructure maintenance contractor. Um, and, and HS1 uh, have a concession to uh, basically own and operate the line from the government on a 30-year lease. So as you can see, we, we have something of a challenge with mixed traffic, with high speeds, very stiff uh, Eurostar trains and very, uh, very high axle loads for passenger trains, mixed in with uh, much lighter domestic javelin services that then go bumping around on the, the rest of Kent. Uh, picking up lots of uh, wheel issues before they come back onto our network. We also run freight trains 
up to a maximum of 140 kilometers an hour. So again, very, very high um, axle loads and uh, slightly different maintenance regimes to those of the uh, passenger services. In total, that equates to about 20 million gross tonnes on the busiest parts of the network. So that's Ebbsfleet into London, and then that gradually decreases as we go out to the coast um, with a, a domestic station at Ashford before or Eurostar traffic only and a little bit of freight down to the Channel Tunnel. So a nice little metaphor for, for the high speed line. Um, this is a hybrid of, of the uh, the best of British and uh, a little bit of French mixed in there. So when it came to carrying out our first S&C renewal at Folkestone, we took the, the highly reliable um, MCM91 equipment that, that we'd used throughout the high speed network to operate the points. And the latest British innovation in the uh, NR60 Mark II design, which um, was interchangeable with the existing footprint, uh, which was uh, 113 vertical um, SNC. As a reference system, we took the uh, TGV MED network. So that was commissioned a couple of years before um, Section 1. So commissioned in 2001, it's about 160 miles long. So um, a similarly small, uh, modern. The difference with the French system being that it's a high speed only network, so they, they don't have to deal with the mixed traffic challenges that we do. Um, as, you, as mentioned on section one, we can get up to 300 kilometers an hour, section two, 230. Um, and that allows us to uh, run with a little bit tighter track centres in section two uh, and also slightly tighter clearances through those single bore tunnels. So our typical track construction you see there, so twin block sleepers with um, SEN60 rail and uh, the Voslo W14 fastening systems. Um, so a great fastening system for maintenance purposes. We get very, very few uh, loose or, or missing fasteners. Um, however, not so easy when it comes to things like rail changing and stressing. They're, they're quite uh, quite slow and quite labour intensive to maintain. Um, the, the track system has a, a couple of very, very well designed features. So as you can see just about it sits above ground level. So uh, the track's effectively about half a meter up in the air, which means that we get very good drainage through the track bed. Um, we, uh, pleased to say, haven't had any uh, any sort of wet bed formation issues. Um, again, the formation is effectively insulated from the the London clay that sits below by a, a layer of type one. We use the um, Alumi cart for a, a lot of our inspection. So uh, this allows us to cover large distances in a single night and also reduces fatigue for the operators. Although uh, there, there have been a few reports of uh, things getting a, li a little bit sleepy uh, on, on some of the longer runs, particularly on the chilly nights. We'll show the, the Recti rail here. So a lot of our historic geometry defects have been driven by poor uh, weld profile. So generally high spots on welds where they've compressed following installation or have been uh, poorly finished. We use the Recti rail system to identify those high spots and allow us to profile them out and saw a, a significant improvement in geometry performance as a, a result of doing so. Going back briefly to the Illumi cart, this is an area we've identified for, for future development. So while we've used it to carry a couple of inspectors to go out and do their work, uh, we're very much looking at the potential future applications of this for uh, transportation and materials. Um, the ability to carry uh, rail testing equipment, for example, and also how we could use this for the capture of um, video footage and, and data that we can then bring back for, for analysis to, to get the most out of what are very, very uh, limited access times that we have available. 
So S and C, we don't use the Illumi car. Uh, we do all of our S and C inspection on foot. Um, and when we re revised the standards uh, about two years ago, we, we made some significant changes to our S and C inspection regime to shift the focus to our highest risk area. As soon as you've got moving parts and discontinuities, your failure risk is going to go up. So we um, change things accordingly. And we again have merged the, the best bits of French and British um, thinking to come up with a, an inspection regime that captures all of the risks that we're aware of. So um, comprehensive component level inspection, geometry inspection and a condition based inspection around the, the switches and the both the fixed and the swing nose crossings. A bit of a, a breakdown of our SNC units, just over 130 units, and out of those, 62 were swing nose crossings of varying lengths. The one in 46 being the, the largest of those designs. And here is one of our, our swing nose crossings. So it was something that absolutely shocked me when I transferred over from the conventional network of TME at Dartford was just how enormous these things are in, in comparison to a uh, conventional sort of CD and E switch. Um, we're talking about a distance from toes to nose of 100 metres, a 40 plus metre long switch panel, and the, the swing nose itself is almost 30 metres long. So um, everything is, is just on a totally different scale. And when you're trying to examine that in the dark, uh, that brings its own unique challenges with actually being able to see between the, the two components. Um, the, the design philosophy, which partly contributes to that larger footprint, um, is around giving better ride quality and, and less jerk um, on switch entry. Um, and it also facilitates as running at up to 160 kilometres an hour on, on the turnout. So if we were to run at a lower turnout speed, the braking distances to, to get a train to use the crossover would be so enormous that it wouldn't be usable in practice. So by having that higher turnout speed, we're able to minimise disruption. And when we need to use single line working uh, to run around a failure, it allows us to, to manage that in service with minimal impact on our customers. The, the design of the long switches and of the swing nose crossing in particular gives us an absolutely minimal wheel transfer area um, or that, that, that unsupported area. So um, we, we keep applying a steering force and support in the wheel of the, the vehicle. So we see much lower impacts. There, there is still definitely some transfer and you've still got two different metals with different wear rates to manage in there. So we've got um, an austenitic manganese cradle um, with a politic steel uh, mobile point running through the middle. So um, we, we do still get, get some issues where we see differential wear leading to vibration, which then transmits through the, the point operating equipment. So um, one of the pieces of work we did with our European colleagues was to look at best practice for the inspection regime in that area to develop uh, a series of checks that allow us to quantify and then treat that, that problem. I mentioned the twin bore tunnels. So this is uh, an example of what one of the slab track tunnels looks like. We have three in total, so Thames Tunnel, that's exactly what it says on the tin, is uh, around three kilometres long. We then have London Tunnel 1, um, which connects St Pancras through Stratford. Uh, it's, um, it's about seven and a half kilometres. And then uh, London Tunnel 2 connects Stratford through to um, Thurrock area. Um, and that, that's about 10 kilometres long. The, the design uh, brings its various challenges. So we, we've effectively got the twin block sleepers embedded into a concrete slab supported by a rubber boot, which um, helps with managing the uh, vibration. 
However, it means that we've effectively got a load of obstacles down the middle of the forefoot. So um, it's a bit like doing very closely spaced hurdles if you uh, try and walk through the forefoot there. Because of that, the carts are used for inspection and we can also go onto the evacuation walkways to be able to see the track. Um, one of the biggest difficulties though is that due to the length of the tunnels and the very steep gradients and the depth it, it's incredibly difficult to get materials in and out of the tunnel so um, the, the intervention shafts allow us to bring minimal things down um, most of it has to come in from one end or the other so where we have a rail defect in the middle of the tunnel we always need plant to bring the material in to bring the welding kit in and, and all the rest of it so that's proved to one of our, our big maintenance headaches over the last couple of years as we've started to see a uh, higher prevalence of rail defects a few other unique examples from high speeds so uh, that's what we call a tight curve so that's 3250 meter radius uh, which requires us to come down to 270 kilometres an hour to uh, stay within our uh, maximum values for cant deficiency. So see an example of the long expansion switches. So these are used uh, to allow for movement of structures. So on the long concrete viaducts to allow for the thermal expansion and contraction. So a, a much longer 600 mil stroke than a, a conventional short expansion switch and again are designed around providing that continuous support to the wheel. Where that doesn't work we then get uh, geometry defects and, and alignment issues over them that we manage through um, tamping and grinding. We've also had historic issues around um, under track crossings where they've been installed at shallow depths which have led to repeated geometry interventions uh, and in the good old days when we were still using Kangos, the, the trapezoidal shape of the sleeper has meant that we've done some damage to the soffit, as you can see there, which has, has resulted in the need for localised sleeper replacement and the use of under sleeper pads to then better manage that vibration as we go back and replace the asset. My, my absolute favourite bit of track design is the the tin shed as it's affectionately known or the east coast mainline box so this structure joins london tunnel one into st pancras and was co constructed as a, a noise attenuation uh, system originally when we've already got a slightly challenging asset on a fixed to floating transition the the absolute last thing you want to do is put a big lump of snc across it so that's precisely uh precisely what the designers did so we now have a scissors crossover spanning a baluster slab transition um on the two line section and where we've got absolutely no way of working around it if anything goes wrong so th this asset takes up a lot of maintenance effort due to the geometry issues fastening issues managing the profile through the common and obtuse crossings and all of that made just a little more difficult by the pigeons that love to nest in there and um coat the infrastructure in a in a layer of not particularly effective lubricant for us Our maintenance and construction tolerances, as you can see, our, our maintenance tolerances are very close to what construction tolerances would be on the conventional network. So this requires a lot of, of effort and a very proactive approach to how we maintain. I'd just like to give you a few examples of how we do that. So first of all, tamping. So geometry, extremely important. We manage our tamping through annual campaigns, so we, we bring in best practice from Europe, uh, bring a dedicated machine and operators to do our geometry maintenance. Predominantly uh, focused around our SNC and then targeting the areas of plain line where we've got um, deteriorating quality over a long length rather than targeting uh, localised defects. So when we do tamp we um 
we have a, a couple of uh, couple of issues around the SNC. So I mentioned the design of the point operating equipment and a bit like HW, it means that we can't tamp in those critical areas around the uh, the POE. So we have to go in and manually treat the misses. Um, once we've completed the tamping of the layout, we uh, use the dynamic track stabiliser. The reason for this is that it, it allows us to consolidate the results of the tamping very quickly and, and provide adequate support conditions for uh, line speed opening. We watch the first train across the asset at 160 kilometers per hour just to make sure there are no issues um, and, and then raise it to 300 kilometers an hour immediately afterwards. If we didn't use the DTS, uh, it, it'd probably take a week to two weeks of traffic to uh, to achieve the same level of consolidation. We also use a ballast regulator to, to make sure we've got a, an optimised profile. As we've seen a lot of issues with uh, ballast pitting on the rail, at the, the very high speeds and dynamic forces that, that we uh, operate at. We have a challenge in managing the uh, the geometry intervention against whole life costs. So we've we've looked at every opportunity to re reduce our tamping volume to reduce that that impact on the ballast. But we also know that we need to stay within the the very tight geometry tolerances that I mentioned earlier. Similarly, the top down approach, uh, rail grinding and management of the profile. So we use. Um, 48 stone machines for plain line and 24 stone machines for SNC. Again, bringing in a European contractor that specialises in grinding of, of high speed railways. Um, we've recently done a, a piece of work looking to optimise our, our intervention frequency to uh, manage the propagation of RCF uh, while also extending our rail life as much as possible on the, the nice straight sections where we can do so. Key to doing that is is being really um, onerous on our contractors to demonstrate their quality outputs and to carry out those checks post work that that we've got the the level of surface roughness that the profile is correct and that everything is finished as we'd expect it to be. We're also currently looking into a trial of rail milling to add, address the areas where we have. Sort of mature RCF um, and, and also to address some corrugation issues that we've seen historically and even since rail replacement at St Pancras where we have a, a combination of uh, tight gradients and steep curves on the approach into the station. Tight curves and steep gradients. <laughs> so so S&C grinding Wheel rail interface, as I mentioned earlier, becomes even more critical around SNC, where we have that the reduced section rail to run on and the transfer to manage. So um, we train grind all of our SNC currently on a three yearly cycle. Again, looking at the uh, the tonnage to further refine those frequencies. Got some examples here of where we carried out switch height reduction. So where we identified the the um, the turnout route over time had not been ground as intensively as the through route and saw a lower volume of traffic and we saw a uh, height difference of up to three to four millimetres uh, between the two. So we undertook this process to measure it, to then shim the, the switch rail to lift it and to then bring it down to the uh, appropriate level relative to the stock. So um, basically uh, artificially wearing the rail. We then have to hand finish the uh, the top in um, on, on both the switches and the, the swing nose. So we are a, a peopleless railway and, and that was built into the asset by design. There has never been any interface between our inspection teams and trains. So we, we were well prepared for some of the challenges that have been experienced elsewhere as the ban on red zone working has come in. What we did realise very early was that due to that, we have a, a limitation of not being able to observe the asset under load and to um, 
see that that dynamic behavior and to hear and feel the things that you do when you stood trackside. So um, we do have the option to cab ride to help with that. And we also effectively have a road that runs alongside the railway through most of the asset, which allows us to stand um, pretty much at eye level with the rail and, and to observe trains over it. So it, it doesn't quite fill in all the gaps, but it is a, a good compromise. A few stats here from our track geometry. So geometry performance is very good. Um, around 99.8% is within our, our target value. Um, faults over time, you can see that as, as the asset ages, the number of uh, action value geometry faults increases. Um, and last last run was an absolute disaster. We had a total of five faults across the uh, the whole of the main line. So um, it, it's uh, ge our geometry performance is, is very good and we use um, manual lifting quite effectively to keep on top of that. There's also a, a screenshot there from our system called Irisis. So this is a, a third party system that we buy in to analyse our geometry. Part of the reason for doing that is that it effectively looks like um, the ECG of someone who's not doing very well. Otherwise, uh, for alignment in particular, we basically get a flat line uh, on the, uh, the conventional trace scale. Failure history. So we uh, are expected to deliver a high level of performance by our customers. Um, they, they expect the train to be there when they want it uh, and, and aren't very accepting of delay and rightly so. So our, our delay targets are measured in seconds, not minutes. So we target five seconds of delay per train. Uh, and we actually deliver on that as well. So in reality, we've achieved closer to three as, as a business over the last few years. Um, the, the failure history, as you can see, we had a bit of a spike around 17, 18, 19, which drove some change in business practices and, and some really, really good work that since in led that brought us back into being a high performing railway. The last few years, a lot of the issues we've seen have been around St Pancras and have, have been the kind of conventional issues uh, that we're used to seeing elsewhere on the network. So uh, a few examples of that. We started off having issues with switchblade damage when uh, we introduced the new Eurostar stock. So the, the new stock had a much higher uh, primary yaw stiffness, which led to very heavy um, contact very heavy steering forces through the switches. Um, since in led a design modification, so we now have a, an RT60 HS1 design, um, which basically beefed up that, that section of the switch uh, and reduced the contact angle. That's been highly successful in reducing switchblade damage, and we've had one or two reports over the, uh, the, the subsequent five or six years. Um, what we are now seeing now is that as the switches aren't breaking, they are wearing, uh, and we're seeing a shift towards P8 type failures. So we're doing some work to better understand the um, the difference in our wheel profiles and, and where the critical limits actually sit and, and how best to manage them through our, our grinding and, wow. and through that management of steering forces in the whole area, not just through the switch. To give you an idea of, of orders and magnitude, um, our, our trains are designed for switches with a radius around three and a half thousand metres, and we're then running them on a, a radius of 350 metres. A couple of other high speed specific things here, so um, pitting um, due to we, we've had issues historically with ice uh, and with ballast. Um, and also for RCF, our trigger radius is a, a lot higher than elsewhere due to the speeds we're running and the wheel profiles. So up to around 3000 meter curves, we do see rolling contact fatigue. A few more familiar failures here. So crack crossings, broken plates, um, railhead damage through a, a short adjustment switch um, and star cracks at bolt holes. 
uh, and then a, a couple of high speed specific ones to finish on and, and some of our more recent history. So um, cracks propagating in, in uh, the high speed switches from RCF. Um, and then the, the most interesting thing that we've had in, in recent times uh, was a report of railhead damage. Uh, so as you can see, we've we've got something with a, a little bit of depth to it. And clearly uh, a, a, an object being struck on the railhead. What we found after going out to assess the defect was uh, a little piece of fence wire with a big flat section in the middle of it. So uh, it, just it illustrates the dynamics at 300 kilometers an hour that, that we can see that that degree of, of damage from something fairly, uh, fairly innocuous. So what next? We, we continue to evolve um, and, and to develop our, our predictive capabilities and our asset understanding working with our, our European counterparts in, in SNCF and InfraBell in particular. Um, and, and that's looking across all aspects of the business. So we've recently gone through an organisation change. Um, we've developed our standards. We've developed our, our training and continue to develop our training. Um, and we also look at our plants and materials one of the big pieces of work that we have ongoing at the moment is to develop our renewal strategy for what will be control period four and beyond. So we're, we're currently in control period three and starting to deliver renewals. Um, the big challenge we have is with the asset, With the asset having been constructed in two sections, we have lots of things that were commissioned at the same time and are wearing at very similar rates. So we need to develop a strategy for how we're going to break that wave and how we're going to split the asset up into manageable chunks. The key thing being though that we deliver all of that renewal before the oldest bit of the asset reaches its failure point. So we're currently doing a modelling exercise to um, predict um, that, that failure rate and to uh, structure our renewals accordingly. What we have done well over the last few years is to develop our capability in changing high speed S and C. So we've renewed three swing nose crossings so far this year and, and are now getting very sharp at doing that. Um, and we're currently looking at the challenges for the future as we start moving uh, high speed switches around and, and things that are more than 40 metres long and therefore span more than two wagons. So um, we, we've exceeded what we can do with road delivery and, and now need to work out how we do it by rail. So uh, a couple of um, bits of, of R&D, bits of innovation to finish. So when it came to developing our ballast cleaning campaign, we needed a way of, of demonstrating that the ballast was at an appropriate point in its life cycle for replacement um, and that, that a half-life clean was justified. So we, we employed a, a contractor called Soul Solutions um, after observing best practice from SNCF. Uh, to look at delivering a, a quicker and more cost-effective solution than um, poor sampling and tile holes. So as you can see, it's it's quite a simple process. We uh, use a a, um, a cone-based penetrometer to uh, measure stiffness. And uh, that gives us an output like you see here. So, sorry, we're having some audio issues in the room with an unruly phone. Um, so, so it gives us stiffness graph, as you see here, where the stiffness increases as we move down through the ballast layers um, before finally hitting um, the foul ballast towards the bottom. Um, and we get this very, very high stiffness in the interlayer. 
what we found on the high speed line was that we then got a refusal at quite a shallow depth, so about a metre below the rail level, as the um, the penetrometer hit the, the compacted layer of type one that we use as a separator. So this technology actually delivers even more benefits. Um, if you're working with a softer formation, it will go right down into your formation and tell you a bit about the properties in there. Um, but we, we were only able to use it in the ballast layer. Um, as you can see, we, we then feed an endoscopic camera down through the, the hole that we've created. Um, and it, it looks through a five millimeter window to, to take images of the ballast showing us the uh, degree of fouling. Um, Sol have also developed a method for using that to calculate the approximate size of the pieces of ballast, which then gave us a grain size distribution curve that allowed us to estimate how much material we'd actually be able to return at the end of the campaign. So th this showed us that we were around the 50% the mark that we thought we'd be. Um, just a very, very quick video just showing what each of those soundings looks like. So as I said, this is a, a five mil window uh, going down through your ballast layers, um, showing you where you've got any uh, any material building up. What, what we generally saw was that we got fines generated from tamping rather than anything coming back up. Um, so finally, to talk a little bit about our, our in-service monitoring capability that, that has been developed and continues to be developed in conjunction with the University of Birmingham um, and more recently with uh, Eurostar and uh, Monirail, which is a, a, a company founded by, uh, by members of uh, Birmingham University. Um, so th this was our approach to overcoming some of the challenges of a peopleless railway and, and to be able to generate some quantifiable data uh, as to how our track was performing in between recording runs and, and to identify any areas of rapid deterioration in comfort for the passenger as a proxy for um, track geometry. First, approach to this was to use a little yellow box that our inspectors took with them on a cab ride, mounted on the vehicle floor, uh, collected loads of data and we came back. Uh, what we did found, find is that carrying this around in a Peli case and trying to explain it to customs officers uh, made it quite a challenge to get into the cab of a Eurostar uh, and as such we were only able to record the conventional parts of the network. So what we've looked towards now is more permanent solutions by mounting things directly to the vehicle so that we get that always on capability. The first attempt at this was driven by uh, an increase in wheel defects with Eurostar and, and we took the approach of looking at the thermal um, so, sorry looking at the temperature due to the forces between the, the wheel and rail. So looking for impacts and slips that would lead to a, a change in temperature and using this to predict uh, where, where we've got issues on the network. So al although the trial was um, pr provided great comfort to us in identifying very few areas of exceedance um, and, and therefore suggested that it, uh, the, the issues might well be coming from elsewhere, the, the thermal data in itself wasn't particularly useful to us in terms of predicting where where we'd need to intervene in the future. Um, to show you a, a quick video of of the wheel rail interface, and if you watch the flange closely, uh, you'll see that as we go around a tight curve, um, we do see it starts to light up as we get the uh, the flange in contact with the rail. So what we saw as part of doing this was that we um, had some high accelerations and, and high impact forces, which we were able to associate with uh, performance in switches and crossings. So this then suggested that we'd be able to use similar data with, with a little bit of refinement to measure these accelerations 
uh, and, and look at them as a measure of right comfort. So we commissioned a piece of work uh, using the parties that I mentioned earlier to um, look at this as, as an in-service monitoring trial. So for the last uh, six months or so, we've, we've had a Eurostar running up and down the network with uh, two sets of, of sensors mounted to it. So one looking at the uh, bogey frame and the other looking at the vehicle body. So the bogey frame gives Eurostar lots of very, very useful data about their wheels and about their suspension, while we look at the vehicle body accelerations as a measure of ride comfort. What the university have been able to do is map this um, against our geo model um, and, and then to plot for each channel the comfort against the European norm so that we can see where green is very comfortable, yellow is acceptable and red is, is uncomfortable. So when we get anything going into the yellow, we get a little dot on the map that, that then prompts us to go back and look at the geometry and look at what might be causing uh, that, that little dot. So um, the, the trial is moving into a, a second stage with, with more of the equipment being deployed and some upgrades to the, the monitoring capability. Um, and, and we're looking at how we combine this with other data sources. So how do we make this part of our inspection regime? How do we link it with um, in-cab uh, video, for example, to allow us to pinpoint exactly what, what feature uh, caused this and, and to give us a more intelligent capability uh, and, and to shift this onto a real-time platform. So rather than going and running a, a single report that we effectively get an alert uh, as, as each of these things happens. So we, we see this as a, a real, um, really promising approach for the future. So ju just to summarise, we our, our target is very much to continue to deliver a high level of performance and availability, but in order to do that, we need to keep on top of our asset and stay ahead of the failure curve. We uh, we may be a new railway by comparison, but we're about to enter our 20th year um, and, and are reaching that point where, uh, where bits start to drop off. So we collaborate very well with, with universities, uh, with our peers in the um, track maintenance community and with the train operators to continue identifying best practice and understanding how our assets interact. We use new technology to uh, improve performance and reliability and are always looking at ways to, to do this better. And, and we ut utilise the data set that we've built up over those 20 years to uh, identify precursors to the failures. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I would now like to take any questions that you may have for Sincin and I. Okay, thank you, uh, Matt, and uh, that's very, uh, very enlightening. I, was, I must say, I was particularly taken with your um, the peering down through the ballast layers um, beneath the sleeper uh, level. Um, I thought that was very, very good in a non-destructive way. So yeah, we'll open the floor to questions now and. There was one in the chat, which I'll start off with, and then I see Richard's got his hand up as well. So David Amuku had asked, do you use AI for monitoring any of the dynamic effects yet? So the short answer at the moment is no. Um, through our research and development programme, we, we are looking at uh, a couple of pieces through, through industry uh, and through research institutions to use AI, but we don't have anything deployed at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard, Richard Hill, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, let me just take my hand down so it's not forever. Um, yeah, sort of related to that question, um, I'm just wondering whether you've considered using the PLPR system or the switches and crossing system that was mentioned at the last PWI safety conference, so you can actually get a view of the, especially the switches, so you can get a view of the um, switches under load conditions, so at least you can see what's going off with them. Yeah, so so PLPR is something that we've explored in the past um, and, and had some uh, issues effectively that, that it's it's not designed around our fastening system. Um, and, and at the time that that was the, the main thing that prohibited us from using it. 
as um, image recognition technology has improved, uh, it, it is a conversation that we've reopened um, and, and there are a, a, a few uh, companies out there that are now saying that they, they may have a, a workable solution. Um, the S and C video inspection is is certainly something that we're keeping an eye on, and uh, I'll have an interface with our, our colleagues in the southern region. So we, we are nominally part of the southern region, um, and and I think I think that is a a potential way forward for get getting the the really it's the daylight information that I feel is missing at the moment. Um, there's there's no substitute for getting on the ground, um, or, although with its obvious safety uh, safety concerns, even without trains running around, there's still lots of moving parts and lots of hazards. So being able to sit in a a, a warm, comfortable room and analyse video footage certainly has its advantages. So it's it's we we're uh, so we're, we're we're keeping an eye on it. Um, but it, it's not one that I've been actively working on at the moment. Thanks very much. Cheers for that, Matthew. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Chris Chris Alexander's asked, um, he's noticed that the check rails on the Swing Nose Crossing, um, are they there, are they necessary or just an additional protective measure? And then there's also a follow-up question about potential for any speed upgrades on the UK portion, or is it uh, already optimised? So check rails first. Okay, <clears throat> there are different types of um, high-speed um, swing nose designs, and for um, for Voslo, this they have a check rail, but it is only for protective measure. The other type of design is the BWG, which is um, part of v VAE. They don't have check rails on their swing noses. Um, potential for height of speed upgrades. We're looking at that in on East Coast, actually on Eastern. So for speed upgrades, um, if you're talking about 140 miles per hour, I think traditional SEN 56 or 113 pounds SNC or plane line are not suitable because the SNC cannot take the high impact forces. And for the plane line, the gauge is 1432, whereas we, we need 1435 at least for high speed running. I hope that answers the question. Okay, we'll take that as a yes. So thank you, thank you, Sin Sin. Um, another question has come in from Adrian Staples. Um, have you considered the rail measurement GMBH system, which is vehicle mounted, but measure um, a wide variety of track defects? It's not one I've, uh, I've no. heard of, to be honest. Yeah. We will investigate, but we haven't heard of that before. OK, thank, thank you for that question, Adrian. Perhaps if you can send some details over, it sounds like uh, Matt and Simpson would be interested to hear a little bit more about that. OK, um, any other uh, any other questions from anyone? Just while we're waiting for uh, people to post questions, uh, I noticed right at the start of the chat there was a question about standards. Um, around swing nose crossing inspection. And I'd, I'd just be interested in your views in terms of standard developments um, that, that, you know, for high speed, um, we, we, do you use network rail standards or is it based on SNCF standards? And, you know, what, what, what does the development story look like? Yeah, so, so effectively we started off with a suite of standards that were derived from SNCF best practice. Um, but effectively, so um, as I should have said, one of our challenges is that we are very small as an organisation. So um, the the technical authority, as is now, consists of the the single professional heads. Um, so uh, I'm the standard owner, but obviously I am not an expert in all things track, um, and, and I'm always looking outside uh, to to keep up to date with developments. Um, so we we have the option to set our own standards and to define those procedures. And certainly the um, the swing nose crossing, how to inspect it, how to maintain it, what those limits are. As we started to look for that best practice, we realised it was an area that that was not as heavily developed 
as the cast crossing inspection procedures are in the UK, for example. Um, so it is something that we've been actively working on with our peers to develop that and is something that will be uh, more fully included into the uh, the next version of our SNC standard as we turn that, that knowledge that we've gained into some you shall, you will, you must um, type, type, uh, type clauses. OK, thank you for that, Matt. Uh, any other questions? Just checking in the chat. Anybody's got anything else? Nothing's come up so far. Well, another quick question from me in terms of how were you affected during the pandemic? Because obviously that affected lots of businesses in, 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 in this country, but I, I would imagine it would have affected um, things like your, your 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 traffic levels as well. So I was just wondering um, what was the sort of story through the pandemic for yourselves? Yeah, it, it, it was an interesting time, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so we, um, since in and I have, have spanned the pandemic um, and, and it did significantly affect traffic volumes uh, that were able to pass over the network. Um, and, and also our ability to uh, inspect and maintain the asset uh, as, as we face similar challenges to everybody else in keeping our people safe and trying to minimise contact and risk of, of infection. So we, we took a very, uh, very pragmatic approach to risk assessing our asset condition um, and our maintenance frequencies and how we could safely deliver things. For example, the Illumi car. We couldn't use it because you had two people um, sat right next to each other for uh, for an hour or so, um, and it, we, we had that immediate. You know, we, we can't. That there are things we could do. We could put a screen on there, but we can't do it tonight. So we, we had a lot of immediate challenges to manage as a as a team and with our delivery colleagues to keep um, inspections happening and to keep trains running. Um, but in in terms of the volume of traffic, we did see a, a fairly significant reduction. Um, I'm pleased to say that is now uh, is now recovering quite strongly. So during that time, we <clears throat> took the opportunity to start instrumenting trains because we couldn't do any cab rides. Cab rides is essential because of the high speed running. We need to make, make sure that the right quality is good. So we couldn't do the cab ride. So we worked with Eurostar as Matt presented and instrumented the train um, because it was a collaboration with all. We managed to instrument the train from the idea of co conception of the idea to running the trial. It took only two months. We had to go through vehicle acceptance, um, testing and all that before we could go on the trial, but it accelerated everything. I mean, normally it would take two years, you know, but it took us two months to start a trial. So it was a very good opportunity to push on with technology. Excellent. Well, well, well done. Um, thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, I'm just looking to see whether there's any other questions in the chat. I don't think there's there's, there's, a, there's anything else. So um, we'll probably, and looking at time, probably look to uh, wrap up shortly. There was one question about um, will the uh, presentation um, uh, be put up? It, it, it's been recorded and the intention will be that it, it will go on the, 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 the website in due course. And just while doing that, a, a plug for everybody that's on the call. Um, if you've not done so already, do check out the um, the updated um, PW, um, PWI website uh, for, for that. Um, def definitely recommend that. So it just uh, just leaves it for uh, myself uh, along with everybody else. And you're getting some nice comments back in terms of thank yous on the chat. And I just echo that. Um, it was my pleasure to work with Sinsin and Matt on the high speed one for a, a period. And um, it was lovely to see all of the, the sort of ongoing and further developments um, that, that you've made there. So um, that, 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 that's excellent. So thank you um, for your time um, today. Uh, a very illuminating and informative talk. And um, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much on behalf of the PWI. So thank you and thanks everyone for joining. I'll, uh, I'll close the call much, there. Thanks, Em. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you.